It is a great day to be in the house of the Lord today, isn't it? I trust that you feel that way as well as I do. Today we're going to be examining God's Word. It's no big surprise to most of you. We'll be in the letter to the Ephesians, and we'll be in chapter 6, and focusing in on verse 18, actually. If I could, may I ask those of you that are healthy enough to go ahead and stand then for the reading of God's infallible, inerrant, and holy word. You can follow along. I'll have the verses behind me. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. And what is that promise? So that it may be well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in the integrity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, serving with good will as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the might of his strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And following three verses are the, the new material, really, from last week and this week. In addition to all, having taken up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, also receive the helmet of salvation and the word of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times with all prayer and petition in the Spirit, and to this end, being on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Thus far are the words of today's Holy Scripture. You may be seated. Let's remind ourselves of Isaiah's words, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God, that stands forever. Jesus said it, and the gospel writers got it down right. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Those of you that have a sermon guide in front of you, you should be able to follow along closely as I introduce today's message right at the top there. In his commentary on Ephesians, the glory of the church, Dr. Homer A. Kent of Grace Seminary in Winona Lake, Indiana, he said one of the greatest mistakes any Christian can make is to assume that salvation in Christ brings the cessation, the stopping, of all problems. Please understand, nowhere in the New Testament, you might want to underline this, nowhere in the New Testament does Jesus ever promise his followers that discipleship was an easy life. Quite to the contrary, Jesus taught repeatedly and strongly that following him would result in difficulty and suffering. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. On one occasion, Jesus even likened this attitude to a king preparing to battle an enemy. And this is described in Luke 14, 31 and following, with Jesus stressing the importance of knowing accurately one's resources so as to battle successfully. 
Here are Jesus' own words. Quote, Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he be strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then none of you can be my disciples who does not give up all his own possessions. So follow me as I, I read verses 13 through 18 one more time. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, having taken up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, also receive the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And now verse 18, where we'll be expositing today, praying at all times with all prayer and petition in the Spirit, and to this end, being on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Let's pray then. Dear God, I do pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be found to be acceptable in your sight, as the psalmist says, because you are our rock. You are our redeemer. We thank you, Lord, for leaving your word, which encourages us each and every day. We thank you for leaving it for us in a a world that is crying out for exactly who you are. So God, open our mind now to teaching from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's begin with a little conversation about our battles. Dr. Kent, the fellow who wrote a little bit of that intro there, his assessment is correct in that the Christian is in a battle and that the Christian needs to know his resources. Today, I certainly believe that the Christian, and I might say it with a small c here, I certainly believe that the Christian that does not read his Bible does not know where he or she is in the battle at all. And they try real hard to just ignore it. Some know they are in a battle, but they don't know what to do, how to fight. So Satan, with his carefully laid schemes and strategies, wins battle after battle. The importance of the battle can't be overemphasized because we do not see it, or perhaps we do not feel it. We often forget it and end up being very passive about a killer. A killer. Satan also seeks to lull us asleep by getting us to believe that difficulties and trials and even demonic activities might only occur when we are helping to do something great for God. Such as what? Such as starting an evangelistic campaign in your neighborhood or planting a new church or preaching a specific targeted message or or working on the mission field. By relegating the war to only those occasions... Satan wins three quarters of the battles. Friends, the battle is first and foremost for the hearts and souls of the non Christian. However, it's also for your heart and my heart. That's why Paul tells them and us to take up the partial armor of God. Oh, you want to change that? You want to change that from reality to myth. Full armor of God. Full armor of God. Otherwise, 
you know you're going to get picked off. Well, now let's examine closely prayers and, and alertness. Satan is actively seeking to defeat you. Incidentally, uh, Scott today prayed about the church in Afghanistan. You know, as soon as the Taliban came, as soon as the Taliban knew that, that we weren't going to be around, they martyred what was called the underground church in Afghanistan. All of them. And we think we can get by with one piece of armor? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <clears throat> Satan is actively seeking to defeat you. He'll do it any way that he can, by any means that he can. If you haven't figured this out yet, here, he doesn't play by the rules. In point of fact, he plays dirty. He will seek to encumber you when you are the most vulnerable, when you're in a position of feeling the most pain or outrage. In other words, when you are hurting the most, he whispers in your ear something. You would never consider it except at this time. Listen, let me, let me ask you, why is it that people in pain so often cry out against God when maybe one of our loved ones dies? Why don't we cry out against Satan and death who actually caused all the misery? Why is it that Satan seems to have his people in our lives at just the right critical time and those people are ready and willing to love when we need love the most? Many even accuse the evangelical church of being less loving than the cults because the Jehovah Witnesses jump in there or the Mormons jump in over here, specifically when tragedy strikes. As a result, many people are sucked into the vacuum of false religions when they're at kind of a low emotional valley in their lives. And here's another one. Why is it that temptations appear to be most available when we are most pressured, when we are the busiest, when we are the least prepared for it. Satan wants to see us fail. Our flesh is working against God's desire for us to be holy, and the world appears glamorous, enticing, attractive, as it communicates its values through very powerful mediums. So how can you and I, little guy, how can we actually repeatedly win these battles? The armor of God. It seems to sum up all the defenses which God has given to us to execute in battle. Listen, it's called the armor of God for a reason. So let's remind ourselves of the true value of God's armor. Here's what, what Paul tells us uh, when he's describing the, exactly what we're supposed to do with this. He says we are to, and this is in verse 10, we are to be strong in the Lord and in the strength, of, not of my own might, but of his might. Verse 11, we are to put on, not the partial armor, but the full armor of God. There's going to be one of those pieces of armor, and you're going to say, I don't really need that one. It doesn't fit. It scrapes against me. It gives me a problem here, a problem there. I don't really need that one. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Verse 11 says, stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Verse 13, resist in the evil day, not when it's convenient for you, but in the middle of the battle. Gird your loins with truth. Verse 14, put on the breastplate of righteousness. And I, and I talked about this the week that I covered that. That's not an offensive weapon. That's the breastplate of righteousness. It's your integrity, your integrity. Once you have received Christ's righteousness, 
Then we're talking about the appearance of righteousness in your life. That's a defensive weapon so that the arrows will bounce off of you. Verse 15, make sure you're shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, with these work boots that are their sandals with, with nails through them. Take up the shield of faith in verse 16. You know, there's a lot of activity on your part, but it's supposed to be be strong, put on, stand firm, resist, gird, put on, shod, take up the shield, take it up, the shield of faith. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. Again in 17, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then 18 and 19, pray in the Spirit. And that's not tongues that's being talked about here. Dr. Kent states, quote, the believer must keep in constant communication with his commander-in-chief in every season of conflict. Only in this way is he enabled to follow the leading of his master closely. Let's address the specifics of prayer, what I call the specifics of prayer. And the, the reason it's specific is because the words for prayer in the Bible are kind of all over the place. You, you think you have a definition, and then over here, somebody uses a different word to mean the same thing. So it's a very general, the words that are used there are very general, but I'll give you a little bit of flavor. Um, the word prayer is the more general term for man's worshipful approach to God. But there's also this word supplication. Supplication emphasizes the making of requests or petitions. Praying is to be in the spirit, and that is in the energy and with the purpose which the indwelling Holy Spirit prompts within the believer. This type of praying will always desire the will of God and will trust him for the victory. By prayer, the Christian warrior is to be watchful for the needs of other believers in conflict and should intercede with God on their behalf. And there's another word that we have in prayer. That's what intercession is all about. We have a spiritual obligation to strengthen one another by prayer and encouragement. Some Christians may be in greater need than others. So believers should be spiritually alert. And that word watchful means being awake, being on guard, uh, staying sleepless in order to help them in various ways, and particularly by prayer. we go. No applause, please. <laughs> okay, there are um, ways to pray when you're in this situation. And so this is going to be longer. This is going to be like part five, and it's going to be a little bit longer, but stick with me on this. There are basically three prayers that need to be made on behalf of ourselves and others in the midst of this spiritual warfare. The number one prayer is that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened. This comes from Ephesians 1.18. So that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened. This is what Paul was praying when he wrote down in Ephesians 1, so that your eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Unless our eyes are open to the battle taking place around us, Satan will be able to continue his work unabashed. So 
we need to pray that God will open eyes both to God's workings and to Satan's schemes. Evil spirits will try to deceive those who oppose their workings. They will try to deceive you into believing that they aren't there or that they've left or that you are powerless against them. And you will need wisdom and clarity of spiritual vision from God to be able to combat them successfully. A second prayer is that the strong man will be bound up. Uh, and that comes from Matthew chapter 12, verses 29 and 30. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. And he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. In order for us to recover the claim back what Satan has stolen from God, Christ instructs us to first bind the strong man. Then we will be able to plunder his or her house. You remember the situation in Mark chapter 9 where the disciples tried to cast out a demon from a boy and they couldn't do it? They, they couldn't do it? And when they asked Christ why they couldn't do it, he responded, well, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. And listen as I read that. That's in Mark 9, 14 and following, but listen to it. And when they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately when the entire crowd saw him, that saw Jesus, they were amazed. And as they ran up, they were greeting Jesus. And Jesus asked them, what are you arguing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. I told your disciples to cast it out and they could not do it. It's interesting how bossy this guy is, isn't it? And he answered them and said, Jesus is Jesus. Oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? And then he says, bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him when he saw him, when the, when the boy saw Jesus, immediately the spirit threw him, the boy, into a convulsion and falling to the ground. He began rolling around, foaming at the mouth. And he asked his, and Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. I'm just guessing here, but I'm guessing a smile came across Jesus' face here. And Jesus said to him, if you can, if you can, you're talking to me, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cried out, and was saying, I do believe, help my unbelief. Now when Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him, and do not enter him again. And after crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out, and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him, and he stood up. And when he came into the house, his disciples began questioning him privately. Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. Sometimes we need to first bind the strong man by prayer before we are able to cast out his forces. 
I want you to note something else there. We didn't hear Jesus' prayer, did we? But the implication is, the inference there is that in some short moment, he shot up an arrow prayer to God. It doesn't have to be an elaborate prayer, does it? We are to persevere in prayer so that God would bind and loose. This approach comes from Matthew chapter 18, verses 18, 19, and 20. Let me go back a little bit. In Matthew 18, 15, Christ talks to his disciples about a disobedient brother and gives them rules regarding how to discipline him. And then Matthew 18, 18 picks up and says the following, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two or three agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who's in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. In this context of obedience and disobedience, Christ also talks about binding and loosening things on earth and in heaven through prayer. When dealing with disobedience and the resulting bondage of Satan, we need to pray that God would bind the person from continuing in the sin and also that God would loosen him from the bondage of it. One author said this, God is waiting on us to lay hold of the authority he has provided for us. We have the authority as joint heirs in prayer to command these forces in the name of Jesus to loose the souls they are binding and blinding. We must stand our ground in this spiritual battle and stand with the authority given to us by God. And then lastly, we are to speak the word of God with boldness. In the very next verse, in Ephesians 6, 19, Paul asks strongly for prayer assistance. You hear what I said? Paul, the, the, the boldest apostle we know, is asking, begging for personal assist, for prayer assistance. Look at his words there. That words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, so that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul is begging them to help him be bolder. Also in Acts 4.31, Luke records Peter and John asking for boldness in their outreach. And when they had prayed earnestly, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with confidence. After binding the strong man and loosening his hold on those who are working with him, we must also pray that we and others will have the opportunity and the boldness to confront those we are praying for with the genuine gospel of Christ. This last approach is primarily so that souls would be saved. In 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 4, we read the following. First of all, then, I exhort you that petitions, that's a form of prayer, and prayers, that's a form of prayer, and requests, that's a form of prayer, and thanksgivings, be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the full knowledge of the truth. Additionally, the beloved disciple John himself wrote in 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask 
and God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. It's not enough to pray that God would loose the sinner and give us boldness. We should also pray that God would draw the person to himself and use us whenever possible in this miraculous procedure, bringing men and women to the light, rescuing them from the very rim of hell, revealing to them the significance of the crucifixion and the resurrection. Amen? Let me close us. Father, we confess that there have been so many times in our life when we we don't want to acknowledge that there's a whole other side. Uh, There's a a whole large, uh, powerful army that we couldn't possibly win by ourselves. We need you. Like Paul, we need you to embolden us, to give us confidence. Uh, God, we pray for results as well, that you would use us somewhere along the line in moving our friends and our relatives and our neighbors closer to you. Help us plant question marks in their minds, Lord, and then walk along a path with them until they can call you Lord. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.